Last week, I recorded the Daily Dose titled, What Do You Say to an Atheist? And I received some feedback saying that the story that I shared about my friend, that he's not actually an atheist. And I just want to say 100% guilty on that count, yes, my friend is not an atheist. He identifies that way, but with the story that I shared, that wasn't a fair comparison. And I want to apologize for that. And so today I would like to, to record part two of what you would say to an atheist and actually answer the question in real terms. Now, Miriam Webster's dictionary defines an atheist as someone who disbelieves that there is a God. And so what do you say to someone like that? Well, it's important to remember that a disbelief in something is still a belief. You're still living under a conviction. And Miriam Webster's dictionary also defines religion as something that affects our attitude, our belief, and our practices. And this is exactly what atheism does. It affects our attitude towards faith. It affects our belief, or it causes us not to have belief, and it definitely affects our practices. And so the first question I have is, are you willing, as an atheist, to accept the fact that you still have a religion? You might say that it is impossible not to have any religion. It's just a question of who you're serving. And assuming that the answer to that first question is yes, my second question is, are you willing to question your faith, to question your religion, your belief, or in the case of an atheist, are you willing to question your disbelief in light of the facts? And so today, I just want to go through a couple of facts, things that are universally accepted to be true. Okay. Now, before we go any further, I just want to bring up the topic of evolution. This is something that frequently comes up when we're talking about atheism. And even though I don't believe that, that evolution is real, I don't believe that it fits in line with scripture, but the main reason I don't believe in evolution is because I don't think the science supports it. And I will record another daily dose explaining why that is. And everything I'm about to say, it kind of comes from that perspective. But it shouldn't stop a person coming to saving faith. For example, a person becomes a Christian, they renounce sin, and then the next week they're repenting of sins that they just committed. And that's because salvation is a process or sanctification is a process. Salvation is instant, but sanctification is the process by which we are made more and more like Jesus. Okay, so there has to be a way that we can work out our faith in fear and trembling. There has to be a way that we can work out what it is that we believe. And so there is space for a person to believe in evolution and Jesus at the same time. I don't know how you reconcile all the verses of what the Bible says, but having a understanding of a scientific theory, it should not prevent you from saying that Jesus is Lord. Because the central message of the gospel is that Jesus is Lord and that Jesus died and rose again on the third day. Okay, so I will talk about evolution in another daily dose. But just moving on to what is the evidence that an, an atheist should be thinking about, should be considering. And the first is that Jesus was a man who really lived. Okay? If you talk to any Bible scholar, a Christian, a Jewish, a non-religious atheistic Bible scholar, it doesn't matter who you're talking to, they all agree that there was a man called Jesus who built a following and he was put to death by the Romans. That is beyond contention. No one seriously doubts that. Now, I'm not saying that you can't find some YouTube video. I'm not saying that there's not some PhD out there who has done some research, but I'm saying the, the general consensus of academic scholarship is that Jesus was a historical character and the events of the Bible are based out of fact. 
we know that Jesus really lived. We know that he built a following. We know that he inspired his disciples and that he was put to death by crucifixion on a cross. The debate relates to whether or not Jesus rose from the dead. And so if you are an atheist, what I would say is that that is the claim that you should be investigating. And history is filled with people investigating this and that leading them to saving faith. For example, C.S. Lewis, that's how he became a Christian. Not because he wanted to, but because he realized that that was the only way. Another famous example is Lee Strobel. He wrote a book which became a movie called The Case for Christ, where he was an award-winning journalist that went out to disprove Christianity and he found that it was true. And I'm not saying what you should believe. I'm not telling you that you can't have a mind. I, quite the opposite. You should use your brain. You should investigate the facts. But I'm just saying that there are many, many examples of people who have done this and they found that it is true. My second piece of evidence, and this is this time I'm going to actually use the Bible, Romans chapter 1, verse 19 and 20. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world. I'm not saying that you need to believe in this book. I'm not saying that you have to believe anything in particular. But what this book is saying is that God has made his eternal power and divine nature clear to everyone since the beginning of the world. That means that it is built into the heart of every man, woman and child that you are able to perceive whether or not there is a God. And this is where we really come back to the theory of evolution, where if everything just came through a natural process, then there's no need for a creator. Okay? I'm not going to tell you how you need to get past that. But what I will say is if you investigate the words of this book, it is woven into your heart. It is woven into the hearts of all people that it will go in like a key into a lock and that lock turns. It opens your heart. And ultimately, Christians don't become Christians because we're afraid of science. We become Christians because God has opened our hearts and we perceive that he is there. So as you're going about your day, if you're an atheist or if you're speaking to an atheist, we need to not be afraid of the facts, but we absolutely need to be willing to examine what we believe about the world and about who we are and where we came from. We need to be willing to examine that based on the facts. And if you have any questions, come and find me. If you want to know where I am, I'm here at Evident Life on a Sunday at 10 a.m. Come to church and then come and find me and we can chat.